اعوذ باللہ السمیع العلیم من الشیطان العین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین و بہی نستعین و صلی اللہ علی سیدنا محمد و علی آلہ الطاہرین اللہم صلی علی محمد و آل محمد رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و حلل اقدتا من لسانی یفقہ قولی السلام علیکم جمیعا و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ um we are at our eighth week of discussion on theology alhamdulillah um today most likely we will end the discussion on uh adl al-ilahi the justice of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um it really depends on um if you want to end this discussion so we, inshallah we will take uh we'll ask your opinions at the end of this class inshallah last week we discussed um the philosophical explanations of the differences between um differences and evils yeah uh, we said um we may view it as discrimination but it for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is differences um so it is not discrimination and for um, it was a very lengthy discussion and you can visit the lecture if um if you have any questions uh, on that subject today we discuss a very important subject and that is what will the fate of non-muslims be Okay this comes under the topic of adl ilahi because is it part of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will only allow muslims to go to heaven for example um or is it part of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will allow non muslims to enter paradise yeah i mean we've worked very hard to obey the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is it fair then that he will allow non muslims to enter paradise um so we we discuss this very important question in other words we're asking the question is islam a pluralistic religion Okay that's that's the topic of discussion for today is Islam a pluralistic religion um before we get to the three different philosophies on this this is a very important discussion for a couple of reasons um where this discussion was based from it 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 shows up in the book of Shaheed Mutahhari Adl Ilahi um in the latter part of the book and it's been translated as well um by um, and there's a foreword by Said Rizwi um it's called Islam and religious pluralism this book is available online and this last section has been translated here um i did uh, for my masters i did this uh, i did an entire paper on this subject so this is basically a summary of my masters paper so um there's been a lot of research which is involved in this um and uh, a lot of points may inshallah it's not complicated but it is going into depth about these subjects as well um The reason this is important to ask is you know we live in a world which is filled with violent clashes and these clashes are always in the name of religion yeah if you look at um for example the the violence between christians and muslims between hindus and sikhs between tamils and buddhists um even between sunnis and shias yeah the the question is that we're denouncing or uh, putting down the other religion um the question we want to ask from these violences is there is there something we can learn from our religion which will allow for there to be um a stop to the violence yani if we are to say um that everybody will be saved will that stop the violence or is there another approach that we must take another reason why this is very important is because we are always asked by muslims and non-muslims alike what will the fate of non-muslims be Yeah this is a question which constantly comes up um and uh, I had a very good friend um and he was a Christian uh Christian man um and he recently wrote an article about the unity of Islam between Muslims and Christians and um he's one of these Christians who doesn't believe that Jesus is the son of God he believes that he is the prophet of God he said this is impossible for God to have a son um so he's a very um in line he's very in line with where our thinking is except that he believes Jesus is the savior um and uh, you know there's a story i always tell about him and i don't know if i've told you but um when we used to go out we'd always used to go out to halal restaurants and when we go to movies and uh if something came on you know we both would put our eyes down and i was very surprised that he would do the same thing and uh, i had more in common with him than a lot of my muslim friends to be very honest and uh, he would always tell me he's like jafar i had a dream that i'm on a hot air balloon and i'm ready to soar but there is one string which is holding me back right and you know i'm always uh, i've been just itching to tell him uh, convert that's it that's that will break the string and then when i went to study in sham i came back one summer and i him and i went out for uh, lunch and i asked him this you know i said okay i'm now i'm ready to talk to him about this our, de- our friendship has developed and i said uh, so what about that dream he's like oh jafar is like the the rope is broken and i'm soaring and i was like really i was like what happened 
Uh, he said, I went to a healing camp. You know, they have healing camps in San Francisco. And he's like, at this camp, he's like, Jafar, with my own eyes, I witnessed a man who had one leg shorter than the other. And he prayed and he said, we all prayed together as a community. And I saw, he says, with my own eyes that his shorter leg became taller. And it became taller than the other leg. And then his other leg grew as well. And the man started crying. And he said, I always wish to be taller as well. Yeah. So he said, after watching that and seeing that and the power of prayer, is like, I'm now soaring with God. Yeah. Now, what will his fate be? Yeah. This guy has yaqeen, certainty in the belief of his religion. What is his fate going to be? And today, inshallah, we will try to answer this as far from an Islamic perspective. Is this person still um, be entered into paradise? Um, or because he does not have the wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, his fate will not be paradise. And that's the important question that we have to ask today. To answer these questions, we look at three different philosophies. One is religious pluralism. And we will discuss these concepts if you're not familiar with it. Perennialism is another very enlightening concept. It's an amazing concept, perennialism. And then the Islamic view. Um, what is religious pluralism? Okay? Religious pluralism, according to a definition by Byrne, Peter Byrne is his name, who was a senior lecturer at King College. Um, he defines religious pluralism as the follows. All major religions, in his view, are equal in respect of making common references to a single transcendent sacred reality. Okay? That means every religion believes in a sacred entity and they call it God, they call it anything else that they want to call it, but that's the fundamental point of every religion, that there is a single transcendent reality that they believe in. Okay? Um, furthermore, all traditions are likewise equal in respect of offering some means or other to human salvation. He says this is true of every religion. Yeah? Whatever religion there is, they offer a path to salvation. That is the point of religion. Um, and whatever that may be, for Christianity that may be in uh, the belief in the sacrifice of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. For Islam it may be the wilaya. But every religion does offer um, uh, some means or the other to human salvation. And the third is that all traditions are equal in that they provide limited, revisable accounts of the nature of the sacred. Yani no religion can full on say who is God and what is God. Yeah? They have some type of understanding of what God is, but nobody knows really what is or who is God. Um, based on this, um, what we understand according to Byrne is that then all religions are equal because they all offer the same exact things. Yeah? And because they are all equal um, and because of the similarities that all of them possess, they are all pluralistic. Yani they, each of them offers the same things, maybe in a different way. But because they offer the same thing, each religion then gives you the same ability to find salvation and to know God. Yeah? That's what pluralism is in a nutshell. Yeah? That they are all equal. Okay? Now we'll discuss this a little bit further. Well, the famous, the, one of the most famous pluralists out there is a person by the name of John Hick. John Hick uh, was a philosopher of religion and theology. If you just Google his name, John Hick Pluralism, he's written so much about this subject of pluralism. Um, and he was a professor at the University of Birmingham in England, and he just died on February 9th of this year. So until then, he was still a lecturer, I believe, at the University of, uh, of uh, uh, Birmingham. Now, John Hick has very interesting views. He is what is known as an ontological pluralist. Okay? And ontological pluralists believe that um, the truth of all religions is a factual one. Okay? That means every religion is true and nobody can deny this. That's his view. Now, opposing the ontological pluralists are what's known as an epistem epistemic pluralist. Okay? An epistemic pluralist claims that no religion can claim its own validity and therefore it must be assumed that all religions are true and authentic. Okay? This is different than an ontological pluralist. There's a fine difference. Ontological pluralists believe that every religion is true and it's a fact that every religion is true. Epistemic pluralists believe there's no way to prove any religion is true. Yeah, they all are coming through revelation of some type or some for of some way and because of that we cannot deny that any religion is true. Okay, so basically every religion is true, but there's no way to prove it. That's what epistemic pluralists say. Um, 
John Hick has the opinion that all religions are true paths to the real. Now he calls it real, he doesn't call it God. Okay? He chooses the word real with a capital R to describe it. He said all religions are true paths to the real because they follow a similar course towards the real. Um, now what is this similar course towards the real? That all religions, whether monotheistic or not, are seeking to take its followers from the path of self-centeredness to real centeredness, which is how salvation is achieved. Very interesting what he says. It's not about finding paradise. It's not about um, anything like that. It's about coming out of the ego that we have and coming with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or coming with the real. Okay, um, so it's, it's leaving us, leaving I, yeah, this I thing that, you know, we say it's so bad to say I. He says that is the focus of every single religion, is to come out of this real, of self-centeredness, of this I, and go into this what is known as real centeredness. Therefore, according to Hick, because all religions share this common belief, every religion has the same thing, yeah, to leave your ego and go towards the real or go towards God, Therefore, all religions are authentic. Yeah? That's his view. All religions are authentic because they all follow the same path. Now, in a nutshell, that is what pluralism is. A, the, a pluralist says that there is a common trend found between all religions. Okay? And that common trend is this, that everyone seeks to go from the self-centeredness to the real centeredness. And therefore, it makes all religions authentic and true. Yeah, that means any path you take, yeah, that will lead you to God. Hmm? Because the, every religion has that in common. Okay? That's what pluralism is. All right? um, there's quite a bit, so we'll go through it and then we'll ask, save your questions inshallah like last time. I think that worked well um, for me. <laughs> um, now we go, you have a question? No? Okay. Uh, now we go to perennialism. Okay? Inshallah pluralism is understood. Yeah? There is a commonality between every religion, therefore every religion is a factual one. Any religion you follow will get you to that result. That is what pluralism is. Perennialism. Perennialism is really a cool concept. Okay? Um, we will discuss now, after discussing perennialism, whether pluralism applies in Islam or not. And then whether perennialism applies in Islam or not. Um, according to the perennial philosophy, Okay, all religions shared a common origin in a perennial, a perennial means a primeval or a primordial, okay, in that original state. Um, all religions share a common origin in a perennial religion which subsequently took different forms. Yeah, that means there is one religion which started it all, okay, and then that religion got transformed into Buddhism into Hinduism, into Christianity, into Judaism, into Islam. But the source of everything is one. Okay? Um, a perennialist, what's interesting about them is that they always look for universal truths. Now what does that mean? This is a very interesting concept. Um, if in a particular situation, for example, one finds something to be true, right? in any situation, you find something to be true, then you can conclude that it is a universal truth because truth is not confined to a specific time and place. Okay? So they look for universal truths. Now, an example of this is, for example, if one says or one finds that it is true that it is raining in Toronto. Yeah? It's raining in Toronto. Um, it doesn't make it true that it is raining everywhere, but it does make it true everywhere that it is raining in Toronto. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah? That is a universal truth. Just because it's raining in Toronto doesn't mean it's raining in um, Los Angeles, right? No. But it does make it true in Los Angeles that it's raining in Toronto. So it's a universal truth. Now, according to them, and these are perennialists, um, I don't even know what's on the slide. Um, <clears throat> The theological story according to perennialists is as follows, okay? And this is how they developed how religion came about. He says they don't deny that there is only one God because the universal truth is one, right? So there has to be only one God. And because of his benevolence and because of his kindness, he discloses to his creation how to be saved, yeah? He wants his creation to be saved because of his kindness and thus he sends revelation. Okay, he sends revelation in his different forms. And because of his kind and just nature, it is not possible for God to play favorites. Yeah, he can't say, I'm only picking one religion. 
It is he who wants mankind to be saved. Yeah? So therefore he cannot play favorites, therefore all the religions are impartial. Yeah? Now what is the proof of this? How do they come up with the idea that all religions are impartial? He says that if you, um, he or she notices that the world religions have survived for thousands of years. Yeah? Thousands of years. Therefore, that is an indication that God is pleased with them. Because if God was not pleased with them, He could easily have stopped that religion and found that right religion. Why? Because He wants us to be saved. Because God wants us to be saved, He will show us the right way to be saved. And because He has not stopped all these other religions, that in itself proves that all other religions are correct. Yeah? This is what a perennialist views. Okay? It is a universal truth that they're talking about. The central idea of the perennial school of thought is that divine truth is one. It is timeless and universal. And that the different religions are but different languages expressing that one truth. It is like a cloud. Okay? It is like a cloud um, which for, from it emanates raindrops. The raindrops are thousands and these are the religions the different religions, but they all come back from one origin and that is that one cloud. Okay? That is what perennialists believe. That it is all one religion, but it has been um, described in different ways, but it all expresses that same one truth that it originates from that one cloud. Okay? This is what perennialism is. Now, an example of a famous perennialist is Hussein Nasser. Okay? We've all heard of Hussein Nasser. Yeah? Hussein Nasser is a very, very uh, uh, famous uh, professor of Islamic studies at the George Washington University and a very well-known Islamic philosopher. Um, brilliant mind, but he is a perennialist. Um, uh, it, and it depends on the texts you read about Hussein Nasser. Uh, for example, sometimes you find that he is called a perennialist. Sometimes you find he's called a universalist. Sometimes you find he's called a traditionalist. Um, because he is defined in so many ways, it, it gives us an understanding that these, these concepts are not far apart from one another. Yeah? One can't be in two different camps at the same time. So the fact that he's been described in this way shows that universalism, traditionalism, and um, uh, perennialism are all similar to one another. Um, according to Nasser, every revealed religion is absolute and special. Okay? Now, we have to keep in mind, Hussein Nasser is an Islamic philosopher, but he believes in this concept of perennialism. He believes that every religion is absolute and it is special. It is absolute in that it holds the absolute truth and lays down a path for reaching this truth. Every religion, no matter what religion it is, has laid out a path. And because of that, it is absolutely true. And that's what makes it absolute. At the same time, it is special. Why? Because it emphasizes the spiritual and psychological needs of a specific community who are the target of that revelation. So Islam came about as a specific target to a certain type of people. Yeah? Um, and a certain type of mindset. Christianity came down with the same mindset. They are absolutely true, but they are special in that they are targeting specific types of people with a specific type of background. Now, we have to make something very clear here. Nasser's philosophy is heavily influenced by Islamic traditions. Nasser does not deny the superiority of Islam. Okay? He believes, um, no doubt about it, that Islam is the absolute true religion. Okay? Um, but he does not deny that other religions are also true and holy. That means he accepts all religions to be true, but he says to him, Islam is the absolute true religion. So. He is a perennialist, but at the same time, you find in him particularism. Um, he is particular that the fact of his belief that Islam is the true religion. Um, so you can say that theologically he gives preference to Islam. However, he maintains the holiness and truth of all other religions. Um, what's very interesting about Hussein Nasser is that he is heavily, heavily influenced by Sufi esoteric interpretations. <laughs> Okay, um, this, this does impact on what he has to say and um, the way we refute Hussein Nasser if we do is very difficult because he is using Sufi esoteric interpretations. Esoteric are botany, 
um, that which is inside of you, a revelation that I get. You know, sometimes you get an, uh, an instinct, you have an instinct about something, that is an esoteric kind of uh, revelation that you have, that you feel something bad is about to happen, and that's something you have inside of you. Now, naturally, Sufis have developed these esoteric interpretations due to years and years of spiritual purification. Okay? Now, he believes that it is from a Sufi perspective that the most profound encounter with the other traditions has been made. And where one can find, this is a quote from his book, when where one can find the indispensable ground for the understanding in depth of other religions today. It is only through Sufi beliefs, he says. The Sufi is one who seeks to transcend the world of forms to journey from multiplicity to unity. Yeah, it goes back to the same unite, unit, uh, unified truth. And from the particular to the universal, he leaves the many, which are down, which all the religions, for the one. And through this very process is granted the vision of the one in many. Very profound. Yeah? Very profound and very cool, to be very honest. Yeah? Um, by leaving this world and not being attached to anything and going towards the one, you then see the one in every single thing out there. Yeah? It's pretty cool. Yeah? It's pretty uh, Sufi. Sufi-like, isn't it? Yeah? It's very Irfani-like as well, you can say. Now, this is the perennial philosophy. Um, the perennial philosophy okay? um, after having understood the perennial philosophy, a very important question needs to be asked. They both sound the same kind of, don't they? Um, they're both finding um, commonalities, you can say, and then from these commonalities, they are saying that every religion is a factual one. However, there is a difference between those two. The perennialists... Um, argue for the transcendent unity of religions, okay? And that they are all connected spiritually while maintaining that each religion is unique and true. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> it's very interesting what the perennial philosophy is, okay? They are not denying the truth of any other religion, but they are saying that they are all somehow spiritually connected with one another. Um, thus, what they do a perennialist, what they do is they respect the differences that revealed religions have with one another. Okay? Therefore, in Islam, the belief that the Qur'an is the final revelation would be respected by a perennialist. It would not be denied by the perennialist. Um, the fact that um, save, um, salvation can only come through the belief of Nabi Isa's sacrifice for Christians, it's an absolute truth. We can't deny it. And therefore, they respect that. Okay, um, a pluralist, on the other hand, views these differences and as an obstacle towards unity. Yeah, um, they view these differences that religions have with one another as an obstacle rather than that which is a uniting. Um, and therefore, they deny. Um, they would have to find ways to disclaim and uh, not accept, for example, the risala of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad or the doctrine of incarnation um, of with Christianity for pluralists the unity of religions um, that which makes all of them true is that they all work towards recentering the soul from the ego to the real okay any other truth that a religion has is an obstacle towards unity yeah therefore they will find excuses to deny or say that this is not true yeah, that's a major difference between perennialism and pluralism. Perennialism will accept the truth of every religion, while pluralists will find that truth as a problem, as a hindrance to unity. Now, we come to the question of religious pluralism in Islam. Okay? Um, is this accepted in Islam or not? This concept of religious pluralism. One of the most famous Muslim writers, English writers. There are far more famous writers than, uh, than uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz Sachedina. Um, Dr. Sarosh from Iran, um, a complete pluralist, okay? but he doesn't write that much in English. Dr. Abdul Aziz Sachedina, um, if you don't know him, a very highly respected author and researcher, uh, professor at a university. Um, in Virginia, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if he's moved to Toronto. He was supposed to move to Toronto. Um, he is an example of a famous Muslim pluralist, okay, who argues that Islam is a pluralistic religion. Um, 
he holds the idea that the religious um, the idea of religious pluralism is strongly embedded within the Quran therefore when he brings about the concept of pluralism he is bringing examples from the Quran to say that look Islam is a pluralistic religion now when you read his books um, he believes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always intended for Islam to be a pluralistic religion Okay, um, especially when it's, we're dealing with the people of the book. Yeah, that means we're dealing with Christians and Jews specifically. Um, he's not talking about non-monotheistic religions, but rather he's talking about monotheistic religions. In his opinion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wanted a pluralistic religion. Okay, and he brings verses from the Quran to say, you see, Allah wanted it this way. However, um, by saying this, that he wanted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted a pluralistic religion, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left the door of salvation open for all the people of the book. Yeah, That means paradise is available for Christians and Jews and Muslims. This is Sajidina's view. Um, even after the revelation of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not close the door of salvation. Um, he believes that it was after the formation of an Islamic state in Medina. Okay, that the concept of exclusivism came about. Okay, um, Islam was never an exclusive religion. Exclusivism means that only Muslims exclusively will be saved. Uh, for Christians, it believes that only Christians exclusively will be saved. This is exclusivism. He's saying that this concept of exclusivism was never there in Islam. But after the state of Medina was established, the people changed what God wanted into an exclusive religion and changed it from pluralism into exclusivism. And this is where he believes, and his ideas, I don't agree with them, but he, he's a scholar, yeah? And he says that the entire concept of shahadatain, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, never existed. It only existed once the state of Medina was established, he says. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by, by, by them making the shahada as, a, um, as a, a motto, you can say, as their motto, um, it, it denied people who did not believe in the shahadatain to come into the realms of salvation or the realms of the people of Medina. Um, very interesting, yeah? Um, to be very honest, I don't know where he comes up with this idea because the concept of shahadatain is mentioned in the Quran as well. Um, so he says that the cornerstone of the pluralistic argument within the Quran is based on the freedom of conscience in matters of faith. He says this concept of freedom of conscience, yeah? Um, where you have a choice is found in the Quran and the example that he gives is the verse of the Quran La ikraha fid deen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's clear yeah, and this is, the exam, um, this is the exact example that he is quoting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there is no compulsion in religion if our Lord, our Creator is saying that there is no compulsion in religion that means he is not, he is not limiting salvation through Islam He's saying you don't have to be a Muslim. You can be any other religion and you can be saved. This is his understanding. Wait, wait. Yeah? If mankind has no compulsion in religion, they are free to choose their own path, thus proving religious pluralism. This is his concept. Okay? Now, this is easily refutable. Yeah? Very easily refutable. Why? The entire verse says there is no compulsion in religion. Truly the right way has become clearly distinct from error. Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it so clear. And you know what? In my brief stint in academic work, this is the problem with academics. Okay? They take half of something that they agree with and then use that as truth. Yeah? And when I did this, I did the same presentation for my master's class and the two professors who are grading me say we all do this. We take what works and we leave what doesn't. So they don't deny doing this. So he just takes half the verse. Because if you read the whole verse, it's quite clear that Allah is not saying that you are free to choose what you want to choose. He's saying the right way is clearly have been made distinct from error. That means you have a choice. He can't force somebody to be a Muslim. But the right way has been made clear. Islam has been made clear to people. Um, 
So this is an argument, and this is one example that he gives, um, which is easily refutable. Um, and this is the, really the problem with people who go for this outlandish theories, is that you can easily poke holes in their theory. If a layperson like me can poke holes in this theory of his about religious pluralism, you can only imagine what scholars can do to these theories. Um, another example that he gives to say that, look, Islam is a pluralistic religion. And this is a very famous verse of the Qur'an, chapter 2, verse number 62, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surely those who believe, and those who are Jews, and the Christians, and the Sabians, whoever believes in Allah in the last day and does good, they shall have their reward from their Lord, and there is no fear for them, nor shall they grieve. Okay? Based on the plain, plain reading of this verse, this verse sounds like a very pluralistic verse. It sounds like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying whether you're a Jew or you're a Christian, you're a Sabian, um, or you are those who believe. Yeah? Yeah? Um, that means Muslims, okay? Um, or Mu'min. Um, whoever you are, you have nothing to fear. Yeah? As long as you believe in God, uh, you believe in the last day, and you do good, yes. Yes, I didn't say that. He said it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. No, he believes in the Prophet. See, like when I wrote this paper, I said then he gives us two choices. One, he says that um, the Prophet decided to ignore God's command. If God wanted a pluralistic religion, and God and the Prophet once he established Medina, he said, you know what? Forget it. I don't care what God has. is. That what he's saying? And he doesn't say that, but that's the only implication that it could have. Right, that he's now saying that the prophet ignored what God had to say. There's major holes in his theory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, isn't it true that this is how it happened? First he said, "Kul la ilaha illallah," and mm-hmm. after that, it says, "Muhammad is Rasulullah." Who said? I read it today. Okay. That everything came in gradual stages. Okay, so but but if it was the prophet, but if it was the prophet who said Muhammad and Rasul, the prophet clearly said Muhammad and Rasulullah in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The prophet said Muhammad and Rasulullah. Um, in, huh? But as a belief in him as being the prophet of God, yeah. Now, if it did not happen at the time of the prophet and it happened after, then there's a different understanding of it. Then it's then the Muslims changed the religion after what the prophet brought. Um, but it does it does leave holes in his argument as far as when it happened, because um, there are clear verses in the Quran, Muhammad and Rasulullah. And uh, uh, when you understand when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is talking about belief and faith, it is not belief and faith the way we want to believe in Him. It is the way He wants us to believe in Him, and He has left the door open for how we want to believe in Him. Um, Let's just come to this verse, yeah? Surely those who believe and those who are Jews and the Christians and the Sabians. What he does is he says this is a clear verse uh, of the Qur'an uh, which, prona- which declares religious pluralism. Now, as we know, we are not allowed to interpret verses on our own, yeah? So when you go and look at any commentary of the Qur'an, any tafsir of the Qur'an, you find a completely different understanding of what this verse means. If you look at, for example, just tafsir al-amthal and tafsir al-mizan, um, the two most prominent tafsirs that we have today, um, they say that this particular verse was revealed when Salman al-Farsi came and joined the camp of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family. When he joined this camp of the Prophet, he felt regret and sadness over those he had left behind who had not found Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse saying that they have nothing to fear and no need to grieve because they believed in that previous to the coming of the Prophet. So it was reserved for a very special incident and a very specific context that this verse was revealed in. Secondly, Al-Amthal, Tafsir Al-Amthal states and it puts a condition saying that this verse particularly refers to those Jews and Christians and Sabians who believed during the revelation of their time. That means it's referring to the Jews who were Jews at the time of Nabi Musa. And then came Nabi Isa and that, that, those who still held on to that religion of Judaism as we know it, it was no longer accepted from them. Now Christianity or Islam as brought by Nabi Isa was accepted or ex- expected from them. Then when the Prophet came, 
that's what was expected from them. So it's talking specifically about those people at the time of their specific revelation. And then third, this verse describes the measuring stick to enter paradise. That is belief in one God, the last day and whoever does good. It doesn't state that automatically everybody will enter paradise. Yeah? Which means that for you to enter paradise, you have to believe in God. But again, it comes back to the same point. Believe in God the way He wants you to believe in Him, not the way we want to believe in Him. Yeah? So that doesn't mean that all Jews, Christians, Muslims will enter paradise. It will be only enter paradise if we believe in Him the way He wants us to believe in Him. Um, therefore, again, based on this argument, we cannot accept that Islam is a religiously pluralistic religion. Okay, um, because we can refute these verses which are brought and he brings many other verses and, and we can refute many of these verses in the same way by looking at the tafasir and by looking at how the explanations are um, and furthermore there are clear verses in the Quran which state that any religion other than Islam will not be accepted yeah, they are so clear in the verses um, for example in Surah Ali Imran verse 85 وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ yeah? Should anyone follow a religion other than Islam, it shall never be accepted from them. Now again, the argument that they bring is a small eye in a big eye. And we don't have time to go into that. If you're really interested in that, they say when Allah says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ When one takes a religion other than Islam, this is not Islam as a capital I of the religion that we believe in. It is a small I. That means any religion which came, Christianity, Judaism and Islam, they're all Islam. And that's all that was brought. So they're saying that it's a small I. And this small I believes, um, is talking about the belief in God. And any way you believe in the oneness of God, in Tawheed. Um, but this is easily refuted. Yeah, easily refuted. Um, and if you just look at books like Islam and Religious Pluralism and all these other books, they clearly refute this concept of a small I and a big I. Um, there is no doubt Mostly all Mufassirin say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Inna deena indallahi al-Islam He's not talking about a small i He's talking about the Islam which was brought by the Prophet <clears throat> So we conclude with perennial uh, pluralism That pluralism, Islam is not a pluralistic religion Islam does, Islam does not leave the door open um, The way they argue that Islam leaves the door open For all other religions to find salvation now what, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that Islam is an exclusivist religion? We will talk about that in the end, yeah, with the Islamic view. But we need to refute first and foremost the pluralistic view, that it has no place in Islam. The perennialist view, okay? <clears throat> Unlike religious pluralism, perennialism presents a much better argument for its inclusion within Islam. A much better argument. Pluralism is very weak in its argument. Pluralism, they have to... Um, uh, stretch the truth quite a bit for it to fit within Islam and pluralism, uh, perennialism doesn't have to do that perennialism um, it can be seen why perennialism is more readily acceptable by Muslims and that is why Hussein Nasr a prominent Shia Muslim believes in this concept of perennialism um, according to Nasr uh, like we said uh, universalism or perennialism, the primary focus is within one's own faith. And then the secondary outlook is a universalist approach to all other faiths. Therefore, it does not require the abandonment of specificities within each religion. Yeah? This is very, very important. Yeah, this is why uh, people are more, tend to, uh, more prone to go towards this. Because... Because... Um, we don't have to deny the superiority of our own faith. By being a perennialist, I can still say that there is no doubt that Shia Islam is the true and right religion. Yeah? Absolutely. But by being a perennialist, you don't deny all other faiths as well. You accept the universalist truth of all other faiths. Yeah? Um, Nasr brings about the concept of universality of prophethood. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described 124,000 prophets. That means that the prophethood is a universal concept. Therefore, all religions who believe in this prophethood, who believe that there was some type of revelation or somebody who brought about a revelation is a true religion because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned 124,000 prophets. And he's clearly mentioned in the Quran, and we'll talk about this in Nabuwa, that some prophets' names we know, some prophets' names we don't know. Some, he sent prophets to all nations. Because of this, there's a universal truth 
that God has sent to all the nations a prophet. Therefore, all nations, whatever they believe in, is a factual truth. The problem with Nasser's ideology is that he falls uh, into some traps. Okay, um, and the traps are is that he believes that uh, universal salvation is for all religions, all religions, whether monotheistic or not. Yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, whether you believe that there's more than one God or not, like uh, other religions may, um, he believes that still you cannot deny the truth of those religions. That's a problem, right? Because the Quran is clear. Indeed, Allah does not forgive that any partner should be ascribed to Him. How can then we say that all religions, whether they believe in monotheism or not, is a true religion? This is a major problem in, in, in Nasser's approach. Now, um, if we were to reserve Nasser's ideology only for Abrahamic faiths and say, okay, you know what, why, don't, why can't we be a, a perennialist, and, and, but um, a particular perennialist, and say that we're not talking about those religions who are non-monotheistic. We're talking about Abrahamic religions. Um, one can easily say that Abrahamic religions have a universal truth with one another. Don't, can't we? We all believe in Ibrahim alayhi salam. We all believe in Musa alayhi salam. We all believe in Isa alayhi salam. So there is no doubt that there is a universal truth. The arguments that they bring to prove this is the same arguments and the same verses that pluralists bring. And we have just gone into this whole spiel about um, going against these verses which pluralists bring. So the same argument is given for perennialism and say that the same verses which they use are the same verses which pluralists use. And since we've um, disputed and refuted the pluralistic verses the same way we refute the perennialist verses. Now the problem is... Um, we have said that advantage that perennialists like Nasser have is that they have a Sufi interpretation. This is the only thing which saves Nasser, to be very honest. Um, because Nasser doesn't rely on ordinary tafasir. Okay? He's relying on Sufi tafasir. Like he's using Ibn Arabi's tafasir. He's using verses described by Rumi, for example, Ghazali. And these people bring about a very flowery approach. Um, and what they bring about is the concepts which they have an unveiling about. You see, an unveiling in Sufi terms is known as a kashf. When I have a kashf about something, I have a spiritual unveiling. And what Rumi and Ghazali and Ibn Arabi do is they describe these verses based on their revelation. It's personal revelations that they've had. And this is the kind of explanations that Nasser uses to prove that there is a perennialist Relig the, the Islam is a perennialist religion. So for example, um, in the verse 136 of Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا نفرق بين أحد منهم We do not um, make any distinction between any of the prophets. Right? Um, Nasr looks at commentary provided by Rumi to explain the universality of religions. So for example, he's Rumi. This is Rumi's commentary now. I think I skipped this slide, I'm sorry. He says, if ten lamps, if ten lamps are present in one place, each differs from the other. Yeah? This is very flowery, okay? So please pay attention. Yeah? If ten lamps are present in one place, each differs from the other. To distinguish one to distinguish without any doubt the light of each when you turn your face towards their light is impossible. Yeah? Very deep, isn't it? Yeah? You have ten lamps. When you turn your face from one to the other, you can, it is impossible to distinguish one light from the other. In things spiritual, there is no division and no numbers. In things spiritual, there is no partition and no individuals. Yeah? This is how Rumi describes this verse. That means all the prophets are equal. Every religion that they brought is equal. Therefore, there is a universal truth between all the religions. And this is the type of explanations that Nasser uses yeah, to describe the verses of the Qur'an. He uses these very esoteric and batani understandings. And unlike um, the other verses in the Qur'an, when you just answer it point blank or look at it point blank, you, it's easy to refute. These are hard to refute because it is based on one's unveiling. It is based on one's kashf. Now, the only way to dispute this, um, 
and again, this is where Nasser's philosophy cannot be accepted. Okay, therefore, Islam is not a perennialist religion as well. Um, it cannot be accepted. Why? Because when one undergoes a spiritual unveiling, when one undergoes a kashf, yeah, that kashf, that unveiling is only hujja for the person who went under that kashf. This is a very important point to understand. Um, this is where people fall into the traps of Irfan and Sufism. I, okay, let's say I am a Sufi master, let's say, and I have an unveiling. The people who are following my tariqah, my way, are basing their life on my unveiling. This, is not, this cannot be done. The unveiling that I have is a gift provided to me from God, if it is coming from God. Okay? It could be a shaitani kashf. Okay? But if it is coming from God to me, it is only for me. Nobody else can use it. Yeah? Therefore, when Rumi goes under the spiritual kashf to describe it, for Rumi this may be true, but nobody else can say Rumi said so, so I am following him. Yeah? Because it is based on kashf. Today, if Ayatollah Sistani says that um, this is uh, tahir, yeah? this is pure. How? I had a dream that this is pure. For Ayatollah Sistani, this is pure. But none of us can take this as hujja. That is why Ayatollah Sistani and any Maraja, when they come up with the rule, they will only look at four particular avenues. They will look at the Qur'an, they will look at Sunnah, they will look at the Aqal, and they will look at consensus, which is Ijma. They will never give Kashf to give a ruling. Okay? If they cannot come up with a ruling, they will always use Ihtiyat. And according to their Ihtiyat, they will give a ruling. This is how Ihtiyati rulings, precautionary rulings come about. Because they cannot find a specific verse or a specific... Hadith, or if they even find a hadith, it may be weak or something like that. But they will never use a kashf and make other people follow the kashf. So this is why we can't accept Nasser's philosophy as well. We have denied, um, refuted pluralism. We have refuted perennialism. What then is the Islamic view? Okay, will non-Muslims be allowed into heaven or not? Okay, um, the best answer. To this question is given by Shaheed Mutahari. Okay, this is truly, and this is my view now. Okay, this is my view. Different scholars may have different views, but I am uh, agreeing with the view of Shaheed Mutahari um, based on my research on this subject. Um, and uh, a lot of scholars do agree with him. Um, there is no doubt uh, that Islam is the right religion. Okay? And there is no doubt that Islam specifically taught by the Prophet ﷺ and the Ahlul Bayt ﷺ is the right religion. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Because the Qur'an is clear. Surely the true religion with Allah is Islam. So we have no doubt, okay, as Muslims, um, that Islam is the right religion and the religion that everybody needs to follow. However, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-encompassing. Yeah? We cannot deny the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, there is no way for us to categorically sit here and say that Christians, this is my view, that Christians will not be allowed into paradise. Yeah? Please, Islam is the right religion. Okay? We cannot categorically say that Christians and Jews will not be denied. We leave that to God. We don't make those type of claims. And therefore, Shaheed Mutahari adopts an inclusivist approach. Okay? Um, there are three main approaches. There is one which is exclusivism. Exclusivism states that only one religion is correct. So an exclusivist would say only Islam is a true religion. A pluralist would say no, all religions are true. An inclusivist will say that Islam, there is no doubt, is a true religion. And we leave the rest to the mercy of God and can't say categorically that he will or he will not accept. Isn't that such a, a calming answer? Yeah? Who are we to judge? Who are we to judge what is inside the heart of somebody? Yeah? Who are we to cause divisions and say that only so and so will go into heaven? Now, I have no doubt that the true religion is through the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt No doubt. Yeah? Um, but we leave the rest to God. Yeah? I'm not saying that they will enter paradise. I'm not saying that. Nor am I categorically saying that they will not enter paradise. Let God decide on this subject. Yeah? And this is an inclusivist approach, which is simple, and it saves 
um, headaches, it saves um, violence, it saves everything when we can say, let God decide. Why do we have to sit here and decide? Yeah? And in my opinion, uh, pluralists and perennialists and extremists have missed the boat altogether. Okay? Um, and this is the conclusion that I drew when I drew this paper. Um, what the problem with religious pluralists and perennialists is, is that they have focused on salvation. We don't need to focus on salvation. Why do we need to focus on who will enter paradise? Rather, we focus on social pluralism. You see, they have focused on religious pluralism by saying that who, will, who is the right religion, all religions are right. But if we focus on social pluralism, yani we are all one in humanity. Yeah? Um, we need to treat one another with respect, whether whatever religion you are. This is what social pluralism means, that we are one and we share things. In, if we say that pluralism is when we have things in common, then social pluralism means that we have one's humanity in common with one another. Yeah? We treat one another with justice, we treat one another with politeness, we treat one another with kindness, we treat one another with love. Let God decide who will be saved. We don't need to do that. And when we focus on social pluralism, you find that the verses which describe social pluralism in the Quran cannot be refuted the way pluralistic verses can be refuted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clear, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female and set you up as nations and tribes so that you may cooperate and recognize one another. If this is not describing social pluralism and the fact that we need to get along with one another, then I don't know what this verse is describing. And this is the problem that many people have got into, is when they try to focus on that which is nearly impossible to prove, when they can focus on this and, and really um, change the course and direction with which we work with in humanity and society. Um, this is the Islamic way, in my opinion. Okay? Um, it is an inclusivist religion. Yeah, inclusivist with this understanding that I described to you and that we need to treat one another in a socially acceptable way because there is a pluralistic um, approach to religion which, approach to which the religion describes which has nothing to do with salvation rather it has to do with how we treat one another and that is what social pluralism is wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi tahirin Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad